Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all today. It's good to be back. I missed you guys last week. Thank you to Jim Norman for filling in. I appreciate that. Uh, if, if you were a dad, I hope you had a good Father's Day. Um, I know I got to hang out with my dad, and I don't get to do that very often, so uh, it, was, it was a good time. So I'm happy to be back, uh, and I have quite a few announcements and things, but before we get into that, uh, if our ushers could come and get ready to take up our offering this morning. Um, if you would like to, to put some uh, to make your offering and you don't have anything with you, you can give online in a few different ways. You can scan that code that you see. Uh, if you're watching us at home today on Facebook Live, you can hit the Give Now button, and that goes directly to us as well. Or you could download our app. If you don't have it yet, the best way to find it is to scan those codes depending on your, your phone, and you can, you can give online there, and you can uh, set up recurring giving or whatever it is that you want to do. And so, uh, please take a few minutes to do that. And so, uh, but moving on through some things we have coming up, um, a few things, uh, first, um, the, our cleaning schedule for July is pretty bare. Uh, so if you would like to, to help and, and volunteer to clean the church, we would love for you to do that. Uh, just remember if you sign up to clean, uh, maybe take a picture of it or set a reminder on your phone or whatever, so that way you remember when it's your week to clean. Uh, and if something comes up and you can't do it, just let somebody know. Uh, we've, we've only had it happen once or twice where somebody missed it or, or signed up and forgot, but uh, we just don't want to, to miss that because then the next person has to clean double. So, uh, And some of you like that. And if you like that, please sign up, and you can clean every week if you want. Um, uh, I also want to make a quick note. Um, many of you gave uh, either financially or, or, or you brought in your buckets for your, our park pails. And we got to deliver those yesterday to quite a few different places. Um, we put a, a few at Princeton Park. We put a few um, at Glenwood. And we put a few out in Bluefield. And it was wonderful. At Glenwood, uh, we... we stopped and, and we, we gave them, set them on the playground there by the parking lot and, and we just saw a family was playing so we just had, hey, our, our church wants you guys to have fun. It was like as soon as they got it before we could even drive away, the little boy had the bubble wand out and was playing um, and then we, we went up to Bluefield Park and we dropped some off and some of our, uh, there was another church there having a church picnic and they walked over and we're like, why are all these buckets sitting on these tables? And they read the note that said it was from us, and they had a wonderful time. And so thank you to everyone who gave to those. Uh, families have found them, and they are enjoying them, uh, which is exactly what they're supposed to do. A few things, uh, some other opportunities to serve our community. We have one this afternoon and this evening. Uh, we'll be serving at Amy's House of Hope today. Uh, we have, do we have all of our people ready to cook? Do we have enough for that? Um, there's been some adjustments. Some people donated some other items, so we don't have to cook quite as much today. Uh, but the actual serving, we do need a few extra hands, and that is from 5 to 7 p.m., and that's at Amy's House of Hope. And so we would love for you to serve there. If you haven't had a chance to do it, it's a wonderful ministry to our community. We ask that you would uh, just try to make the time to do that if you can. Uh, a few other things. Tomorrow... Tomorrow evening from 6, uh, starting at 6 p.m., is our first day of Vacation Bible School. I've been talking about this for a long time, and you thought it was never going to show up, and it's here. VBS starts tomorrow. I know they've been working really hard and decorating uh, and having some planning and, and getting a few of the last-minute things ironed out, so I'm very excited to get to participate and see what that looks like. That We are partnering with our sister church on Mahood. Uh, and so we are very excited to see what that is. And that is tomorrow, starts tomorrow, June 26th through the 30th. Uh, if you have kids and you'd like to register and you haven't done so, we've made it easy. You can scan that code and register right now if you'd like. Uh, so, uh, or you can sign up when you get there uh, if you have to. But we're really excited about what Vacation Bible School has in store for us this year. And finally... Uh, there will be no Wednesday evening services at Landmark this week because everything is over at Mahood. Um, and the very last thing I need to mention is that Mary's Cradle is still doing their crib campaign through the end of the month. And so uh, we've raised uh, quite a few, uh, or not quite a few, but uh, we've raised a decent amount of money so far. But if you haven't had a chance to give to that, we would love for you to do so. 
uh, you can uh, write a check or put cash in an envelope or something and put it in the offering box on your way out the door, and we'll get that where it needs to go. So $150 buys one convertible crib for a family that needs it. Uh, but if you can't cover that whole cost, your 20 bucks plus somebody else's 30 bucks plus somebody else's 50 bucks, you know how you know how math works. Eventually, it adds up, and we get more than than you would think. So, uh, give what you can if that's something near to your heart. I think that is it for the announcements today. But if I missed anything, I just got back, so it's whatever. Let, would you stand and pray with us as we move to musical worship today? God, we thank you for opportunities to, to impact this community. Something as simple as a, a bucket with, you know, play toys for families. God, we got to see smiles on faces yesterday. And it's not just about that, but now that they know that there's a church that loves them and cares about them, even in the little things. God, we thank you for, for ministries in our community like Amy's House of Hope and Mary's Cradle who provide dignity and uh, necessary supplies for families and, and individuals who need them. And God, those are the people you care about the most, are those who perhaps we have overlooked. So give us your eyes to see them as we seek to serve this community. We ask that you would be in our presence today as we come together to worship you. God, we ask that you would take all of the distractions that we've brought with us. We ask that you would take those from the forefronts of our minds that we could focus on you today through these songs and through the scriptures in just a little bit. God, speak to us today. We come into your presence to meet with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Welcome and let's worship. <laughs>
thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Who can list the glorious miracles of the Lord? Who can ever praise him enough? He commanded the Red Sea to dry up. He led, the, he led Israel across the sea as if it were a desert. So he rescued them from their enemies and redeemed them from their foes. Psalm 106, 1 through 2, 9 through 10.
Psalm 19, 1 through 2 says, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. thank you for these wonderful songs about your strength and your power and your goodness and how you just keep reaching to us over and over and over again. Lord, I pray that you would settle these truths deep in our hearts, that when things don't look predictable or going the way that everything was planned, God, we can rely on you and your promises. Jesus, we ask that you would bless the rest of the service today, all the things that are said and done, and bless the children as they go learn about the stories of Jesus, too. And we ask it all in your name. Amen. All right. We are going to dismiss our kids to Children's Church. We've got Emma and Yvonne. They're our children's workers. So you can follow these ladies all the way out to the children's wing. 
and uh, shake hands with someone around you and greet someone. It is good to be back with you guys this morning, and I know I said thank you to Jim Norman earlier today. He's not here this morning, but thank you, Jim, for filling in. He does a, a great job. Um, it's good to be back. For those who don't know, if you came last week or watched last week, that was Jim. I'm Jeff. It starts with J, but, uh, but we're different, uh, so it, I'm, I'm glad to be back. I was out of town visiting my folks uh, down in Florida, and I, I, I thought I was bringing sunshine back, but I brought rain back instead for the first couple of days, uh, but now it looks like it's going to be a beautiful afternoon, so um, I had all kinds of ideas in mind for this sermon this morning. When I got back in the office on Wednesday morning, I was I had all these wonderful ideas of things flowing. I'm like, I got, uh, you know, I, I, every now and then things catch my attention, so I have to take notes really quickly so I don't forget them, and I was like, oh, I got these great ideas, and then uh, none of them are what came out. So something caught my attention on Thursday morning. Um, I was I was waking up, going uh, took Grayson. He did a little summer school thing, so I was taking him to school. And then uh, something caught my attention on Facebook of all places. Um, and God spoke very clearly and very plainly to me. And He says, "This is what you're going to talk about." Now, if He doesn't do that, I will miss things. He has to be very clear with me because I. I'm not, I don't get subtleties, and so it's just this, this overwhelming sense that, like, this is the thing you need to talk about today, and then um, this is a topic that I don't talk about a lot uh, for, well, basically because I'm just really, really bad at it. This is an area of weakness for me, something that I am very, 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 very bad at, and so it's, it's not something, you know, I, 
I, I never want to tell anybody to do something that I haven't done. I never want to, to there, there's a saying in, 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 in lots of things, especially in ministry, that we can't take people to a place we haven't been. And this is a place that I do not regularly go to. Uh, where I truly struggle with this. And, and on the surface, when you, you see that we're talking about rest, maybe you're like, that's not that big of a deal. Uh, but it truthfully and honestly is, and we'll find out why uh, this morning. And so let's pray about it, and then we'll talk about rest and what that means for the Christian. God, we thank you for today, for speaking to us through the music already. God, you are always at work, but, but we don't have to be. As a matter of fact, you tell us not to be. And so this morning, as we come and we study the scriptures and we understand this idea of rest, may we recognize that no matter what the culture around us says, you have called us to find time to, re to rest and not necessarily to sleep or not necessarily to be lazy and lounge around, but to, to rest in you. And God, what does that look like? What does that mean? Well, we ask that you would tell us and show us very clearly today. The rest, the kind of rest that you desire for your people to have. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier that what caught my attention to this was a Facebook post. And I don't know if any of you guys are on Facebook, but every now and then these things come up. They're not from actual people. They're from these, these like, they're called listicles, right? It's like top ten reasons, whatever, and you click it and it's stuff. This was kind of one of those things. Um, and I was going to share it with you today, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things that, like, pops up, and then you're like, oh, I should go back and find it, and then it's gone again. You guys ever do that? You're like, oh, I want to send that to somebody, and then it's gone. Uh, and so th it's gone. But the post I saw, it was just a clip of a conversation about rest, and you were supposed to click on it, and it would take you to Reddit, and there'd be this whole conversation and whatever. But the thing that I saw was someone had posted something to the effect of, uh, make sure you take the time to rest before your body decides for you. And then it was like this conversation of people explaining like how they've come to find that to be true. Somebody was like, well, he's like, that's so true. He's like, one time I was, I was working 50, 60 hours a week and just grinding and grinding and grinding. And then uh, I got sick for like three months. <laughs> and he's like, so there's, this is a real thing. People talk about this. It's a conversation that people have. And so... Um, there were lots of comments of people sharing stories of how their bodies just gave out on them because they didn't take time to stop. Uh, either they got sick or, or maybe they felt fine and went to bed one night and then they just slept for like three days and didn't even, didn't even know what happened. It's, this stuff happens. And the idea here, though, is that the human body can only do so much before it starts shutting down on us. And... Uh, now, everyone is different, and everybody has different limits to when their body, you know, when that is for them, when their bodies will tell them to stop, but it's true for all of us, and, and the fact is, it's supposed to be that way. We're not meant to, to run 24-7. We're not meant to always be on. God built into creation, not just humans, but all of creation. God built in this idea of taking time to stop and to rest. Uh, including us, and it's from, we see that in the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, it says, By the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing, so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, it's interesting to note that God rests. God doesn't have to rest. He sets this as an example for us. He doesn't need to do that. The, the work of creation, if you read the accounts, it, it wasn't strenuous physical activity for him. He just said things and it happened. This, this was not hard labor for God to create everything. He just took a step back and rested, not for his benefit, but for ours. And we also see this idea come up again in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. This is a list of the Ten Commandments. The first time we see them, you can find that list again in Deuteronomy. But uh, in Exodus, we get to this commandment. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And the Sabbath, that's a fancy church word we like to use. It just means seven. It's just the seventh day. 
So remember the Sabbath, the Sabbath and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but, on, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. It's a thing that we are called to do. We are called to rest. The Sabbath is the one day in the week where you sit around and do essentially it says no work, right? But so what do you do if you're not working? What do you do? Well, uh, other places in Scripture t- teach us what you're supposed to do on the Sabbath. It's worship. You do no work. You just focus on God. You spend more time in prayer, maybe, than you normally do, or or maybe you you spend a little extra time that day studying scriptures, or or maybe you just sit around and talk about God with your friends or family or those around you. That's actually what it means to keep something holy. Uh, I know that's a word that we use in church all the time. We sing that word all the time, and maybe we don't exactly know what holy means. Uh, some people think it means perfect, and that's not exactly it. But holy means that it is set apart for God, set aside just for God. And so there's, there's some time that we are called to set aside just for him. And that's what it means, uh, or sorry, uh, in, in so many people in our society, including myself, we live like this commandment is optional. Again, this was in Exodus. That's the Ten Commandments. That's not an option. But we do. We, we kind of brush Sabbath off to the side. Like murder, okay, bad idea. Let's not do that. Uh, stealing, lying, cheating, those are all bad. But resting... Eh, we don't really need that one. But that's not the way we're called to live. It's not optional. But in our age of constant connection and always grinding to get ahead, it can be a challenge to rest. I know that there are lots of, um, uh, right now, there's a weird conversation in between the, the people entering the workforce. You have your baby boomers and you have your millennials and your Gen Zs on the other side entering. And there's this difficult conversation and then Gen X, you guys are just stuck in the middle. You don't know what's going on. Um, you've been dazed and confused since 1993. So, uh, right? So, but there's this conversation, and you can even see it in conversations. This, this, this certain, the older generation has been taught that you always go above and beyond, and you dedicate yourself to your work, and you, you just work, and you work, and you work, and you, you don't ever really stop. You just keep grinding to make a better life for yourself or climb the corporate ladder or do what you do. And now these younger generations are coming along and like, I don't want to do that. I want to, to, to work and contribute, but I also want to be able to stop and take time to enjoy the fruits of that labor. And there's a difficult uh, dynamic in the, in the workforce right now as people are trying to, uh, to work this back in. Because for so long, rest wasn't part of the deal. Even now, you can find uh, what they call influencers on social media who tell you that the best way to be successful is just to get up before everybody else is up and to work after everybody else has gone home and to work every day and to grind it. The grind is the word that they use, right? Just to, to work every single day to get ahead. But that's not what Scripture teaches us. And it's, it's fine coming in early, and it's fine to, to do more than expected. As Christ followers, we should do our absolute best in whatever we do anyway, because we're not really doing it for for people. We're doing it for God. But there's a limit. We have to find a way to rest. And and, and even if you're not challenged in your work to do that, maybe it's easy for you to go home from work and and turn that switch off. And you're like, when I'm home, I'm home. When I'm at work, I'm at work. But these things, they keep us connected. They keep us on all the time. It's a challenge to rest because somebody can get us at a moment's notice. And it's a commandment to rest. It's not a suggestion. And that's hard for us to, to wrap our minds around sometimes. And, and again, I, uh, I point back to Exodus in chapter 34, verse 21. Six days you shall labor, but on the seventh day you shall rest. 
even during the plowing season and harvest, you must rest. God, it's so important that he repeats himself a few chapters later. He's like, look, I don't care if it's harvest season. I don't care if it's plowing season. I don't care what else you have to do. You stop and rest. You shall rest. Keep that day holy. Keep that time holy. Now, even, again, this is not something that I'm very good at. And so I always question, well, God, why? Even now, I've been following God for just around 20 years now, which is, to some of you, that's a long time. To some of you, you're like, you're just getting started. And that's great. But even after following God for almost 20 years, I still ask why all the time, especially when I see something that I'm not doing or maybe don't want to do, uh, or maybe I'm just not doing well. And so I'm like, God, why do I suck at this? Why do I even need to try that? Why do I need to work on this? What's the point? So I did some digging to see why God wants it that way. Why should we rest? Why can't we just be productive all the time? I mean, if I could work an extra day and get ahead of other people, like that should be good for me, right? Why can't I do that? Why do you tell me not to? What's the point of the Sabbath? Well, the point is to connect with him without any distractions or any other obligations. The point is to be grounded. The point is that, our, that we were not made, as I, I mentioned earlier, we weren't made to just be on all the time. Like, that's not how God designed us. And so if we do that, we're going to get burned out. And we're going to lose our, our lust for life. We're going to not be able to fulfill the obligations that we've made, both to God and to other people. We're not going to be effective if we don't stop and rest. It's so opposite of everything that our world teaches us, right? Our world says work and work and work, and that's how you get ahead. But God says, look, if you want to get ahead, you got to stop working at least just for a little while. And the point is for us to focus on him. No distractions, no obligations, nothing else that I need to be trying to get done. And God created the Sabbath day of rest as a gift to us, believe it or not. Again, I mentioned earlier in Genesis, he didn't need to do that. The, creating things was not difficult for God. It wasn't hard for him. He's like, oh, I need a, I need a day off. He, it's a gift for us. And we see that in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, says, then, this is Jesus speaking, and he says, then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's a gift for us. And then in Matthew chapter 11, uh, verses 28 and 30, Jesus talks about this idea of rest again. These people, they may be keeping a physical Sabbath, these people that were listening to him, maybe they didn't work on Saturday or whatever, and they had all the, you can read the New Testament and see all the, the laws and loopholes and rules for how they, they did stuff on the Sabbath without actually working. But Jesus is teaching them, he's like, look, it's not supposed to be that way. And he says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's a gift for us. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find, there's that word again, rest. But not just for your bodies, rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When you take this time to focus only on God for your Sabbath time, whatever that may be, and not the cares of the world, it will change your life. And I know because I've been trying to, to work this into my life. And the days, the weeks when I get it right are so much better than the weeks when I get it wrong. The other six days of your week can be different. Your focus in life will change. Your walk with God will grow deeper. And you'll actually be even more productive on those other six days. I know it doesn't make any sense, but it's absolutely true. And even though I know all of those things to be true, even though I've even experienced some of that in my life, and I know that God's design is what's best for me, and even though I know that I need to stop and rest, there are, if I'm honest with you, more times than not, I still don't do it. Is anybody else with me on that? Just me? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I don't do it. As, as a matter of fact, I've... I've basically forgotten how to be still, right? Scripture tells us, be still and know that I am God. 
I don't remember how to even do that. I can be physically still, although that's incredibly difficult, but I can be physically still, but this is still going. My mind is racing. There's things I got to do and places I got to be and stuff that I want to accomplish, and it's incredibly difficult for me. And you can ask my wife, uh, even just a couple weeks ago, we were sitting at home. Um, I had come home from the office and we're getting stuff ready. I don't, she's like, you're like, I'm sitting down watching TV. I still have my shoes on and everything. And she's like, what's wrong with you? Like your day is over. I'm like, I still have to take the dogs out one more time. My day's not done yet. I cannot rest yet. And she's like, do you even know how to do that? And I said, I don't think I do. I don't like, I don't know. I don't know. Like I know how to go to sleep at night. I can do that except for the last few nights. Because uh, I got this weird allergy cough thing that's been, I got like four hours of sleep last night. So I'm going to rest today uh, as, soon as, as soon as my body stops working today. Uh, but like I know how to sleep at night, but I don't know how to unplug and shut off the noise of everything else around me. I don't know if you guys understand what that's like. I think many of you do. Even when I'm not working, my mind is. And I'm currently at this point, incapable of truly resting. And there's a lot of reasons for that that I'm working through right now. Me and God are, are having those conversations as to why that's hard for me. Uh, but I share this not because, uh, you know, for sympathy or whatever, but just even I saw a few other hands. I know I'm not the only one that struggles with this. So what does it mean to really rest? Well, I mean, how do we, how do, we do that? And I'm trying to figure this out. I'm not there yet. I know what the book says to do. I just don't know exactly how to do it, if that makes sense, right? So, so what does this mean? Well, a lot of, I think part of it, maybe part of my issue and maybe part of yours, is that we've, we've, we've learned somewhere along the way that rest, uh, e it either means to sleep or it means to be lazy. And re sleep is part of that, but but resting is not exactly lazy, right? Uh, too often we think that if we're going to take a day to rest, it means we should just be lazy and lounge around and not do anything all day. And there may be some element to that in our restful times, but that's not the whole story. See, rest is about a few different things. Rest is actually intentional. There's a point behind it. Rest is about recovery, first of all. It's knowing that when we are drained, when we're exhausted, and when we need to breathe deeply for a while, it's knowing ourselves enough to know, I need a minute. It's knowing our limits and how we're handling the demands of our daily lives. And in order for our bodies and hearts and minds and spirits and souls to recover, we must receive abundant rest. And that includes a few other daily things, not just the Sabbath, but it includes even sleeping well at night or trying to. If we find ourselves tired on a regular basis, it's wise for us to evaluate not only the amount of nightly sleep we're getting, but the time frame when we're getting it. Rest is also about refreshment. It's learning what energizes us and what doesn't. It's choosing to add in activities or stillness, like taking out things, that will bring refreshing times to our spirits. If we continue to do things that drain us when we should be finding things that fill us, refreshment never comes. Like there's always going to be something else that needs to be done. But if you don't take time and do things that refresh you and recharge you, those other things are never going to get done at least not done well. We must make more deposits than withdrawals during our times of rest. And rest is also about renewal. It's experiencing a deep renewal in all parts of our lives. And, and that comes from using this rest to spend time with God so that we're spiritually made new. We talk a lot of times in the church about revival. And a lot of us have this picture that revival means some big, some big preacher has come into town and set up a tent somewhere, and we're going to go, and, and people are going to get saved. That's evangelism. That's not revival. Those are different things. Revival is when we come back to life again. 
like coming, it was, it was dead or dying, and it comes back to life. And renewal is also that word. And so this is what spending time with God, we each need that time of revival or renewal in our lives. It's not just when some preacher comes to town and does services every night for a week. Revival is almost a daily or at least a weekly occurrence in the lives of believers, or at least it should be. We got to spend time with God so that we're spiritually made new or made alive again. And while we may love to do certain things that refresh us mentally, ultimately we need our spirits refreshed by spending time with God. We need to do that every day, but especially on our Sabbath rest day, whenever that is. So how do we do that? What exactly should we be doing on our, our rest time or our rest day? And it's going to be different for everybody. Some things recharge you and some things drain you. Some things that I love to do that are uh, relaxing for me may be incredibly stressful for you. Um, and it depends on your, you know, if you've got kids, maybe you don't get, you can't take a whole day. Maybe you just got to take a couple hours here or there, however it works in your schedule. But it's different for everyone. But here's two things that should be worked in so that your Sabbath day can be intentional and focused on God, not just a lazy day of lounging around in your jammies and being waited on hand and foot, although that would be nice too. <clears throat> Number one, the biggest thing is to meditate on Scripture. And it doesn't have, you don't have to like lock yourself in a room and read the Bible cover to cover once a week. Like that's not exactly what you need to do, although if you can do that, that's fine. But that's probably not the best use. What you should do is focus your thoughts on what God is saying to us through his word. See, the, the Bible is not just some book. It's God trying to speak to us, trying to teach us, trying to talk to us. It are his words to us. And the Bible mentions meditation over 20 times and calls us to meditate on God's word. Now, when I was growing up, not in the church, when I heard meditate, I thought it meant I had to sit cross-legged with my fingers and just go on like that's what I thought meditating was but that's not really it to meditate on something just means to think about it to focus on it to pay attention to it to turn it over and over in your mind and so as we spend time reading the Bible each day we can look deeply into the pages and begin a conversation with God. You can do that every day, but especially on your day of rest. Maybe you'll, you should have a little bit more time than normal to think about things. And we'll do this together just for fun. We're going to dissect Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. We're going to just do this together. So what you would do on your day or, or hour or two hours or afternoon or whatever of rest time is to get a, a scripture. Um, I like to, to read the Bible on my phone, but if I'm trying to unplug and disconnect, I need a physical copy, so that way it's not going to light up and beep at me when somebody tries to call me, okay? Uh, but you, you open your scriptures, and you find a passage. Maybe it's a continuation of something you were reading. Maybe it's your favorite verse. Maybe it's something uh, Beth said on Sunday school or Wednesday night or, or Sunday morning or whatever. And so for today's example, we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4. And so the first thing you do, you read it. And so we're going to read this. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Get rid of those things. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So we read those passages, and again, you don't have to read chapters and chapters. Just get a little section, a paragraph, or a couple sentences. And then you meditate, and you think about it. So maybe you read it again, and maybe you slow it down. Maybe you just read one word at a time. And, and we look at it again. And can we back up for me, Jamie? So we look at it, and we say, okay, get rid of all bitterness. Well, do I have some bitterness? How does this apply to me? God, do I have some bitterness right now? Do I have some rage or, or anger? Have, have I brawled with anybody lately? You should know the answer to that, okay? Uh, have I slandered anyone or gossiped or, or malice? Like Maybe you have to take a minute and look up those words and be like, well, what exactly is slander? What is malice? Do I have that? I don't know. Let me look it up. What does it mean? 
right? Are my, am I an angry person? Are my words harsh, right? And then we would, we would look at, at 32, and we're like, okay, I don't want to do those things, but what should I do instead? Well, be kind and compassionate to one another. Well, am I tender-hearted? Do I forgive others freely? And that's a conversation you have with God. And then you just wait and listen and you sit in those moments and be still and think about it. And maybe he'll talk to you audibly, but probably not. He'll just bring things to mind and you'll be like, oh, you're right, God. I was, I was pretty angry with that person yesterday. Or God, you know what? I remember, you know, this morning I was able to be compassionate and I forgave somebody. And so, you know, you can have those conversations. That's what it means to meditate. We can allow these scriptural meditations to go with us throughout our day, making us aware of some of those things. Maybe bitterness, anger, hard-heartedness, or unforgiveness, kind of attempting to hijack us throughout the rest of that day. This is what it is to meditate on God's Word. You just read it. And spend extra time thinking about it and talking to God about it. It provides a a new level of rest for us because we're going to be spending our mental energy thinking about God's words instead of drowning our minds with all the other worries of the world. And we'll we'll walk away from that feeling refreshed and energized, which is weird because it shouldn't work that way. But in God's kingdom, everything is backwards to how we would normally do it. But not only that, but we'll have the power to apply these life-changing words from God to our lives when we spend time meditating on it. It won't just be something that goes in one ear and out the other, but we'll actually be able to see how God is starting to move in those areas. We can't help but become what God wants us to be when we put those kind of effort in, when we're intentional about resting in his word, which I know sounds like work. Again, this is God and everything doesn't make sense. And the second thing you can do, meditating, is is to journal. And maybe that's not your thing, it's not really my thing, but it's incredibly helpful. For some of you, maybe you do journal all the time, and you're like, maybe you got like six notebooks in your car right now, I don't know. But I know that it may not sound like everybody's thing, but writing down your thoughts and prayers and insights while you read scripture will allow those words to come alive in your life. We, take, we do this in youth groups. You come to Landmark Youth Group, we write our prayer requests and our attendance in a little booklet, uh, and we have since I got here. And it's amazing to take time and open that up and look back a couple weeks or a couple months ago, the things that we prayed about and how God has brought them to fruition. You can do that in your own life with a journal. Write down what scripture passage you talked about. Write down some of the questions you asked God or some of the things you think he was talking to you about. Maybe write down some prayer requests and then revisit those things later, and it's amazing to see. And here's a basic outline for journaling. Pick a passage and read it. Read it again. Write it down. Pray for insight and write down whatever else God brings to your mind. It's, it's not very complicated. It's not really, there's not really a science or a formula to it. Just kind of open it up and put the date and then whatever you were doing with your time there. And you'll be amazed at how that helps take your rest to the next level, which, again, sounds weird. I'm going to rest super hardcore this weekend, right? That's weird, but that's exactly it. Because the truth is, rest doesn't happen by itself, especially in this age of, of Internet connectivity between smartphones and social media and emails and never-ending things and the pressure to always be working Rest doesn't happen by itself. And so it's, it's odd, but it takes work to rest. <laughs> if we really want to rest, we need to make a plan. So uh, this is my challenge to myself and to you. Set aside some time in your week to do nothing but focus on God. No chores, no homework, no distractions. This is a tough one. No kids for maybe like, for like an hour at least. If you can get more, take it, right? No nothing. Now, you will still, like, life doesn't stop for us. 
And so we'll have to either, if we have responsibilities, we're going to have to do them before or after to clear that space away, maybe. Maybe you'll need to use your phone and, and set a meeting on your calendar. I, I heard a sermon a long time ago that says, on my calendar, uh, I set up meeting with God. And you schedule it just like you would any other meeting. And so you don't ever miss it. Maybe that's a thing that you guys can, can take from that. But as we get ready to close and, and, and sing together in just a minute, the truth is that resting is not an option. And God commands all of, uh, all of creation to rest, including us. And so when I take that time and I say, God, you know what? I don't need to rest. I don't want to rest. When I refuse to do that, I'm telling God that he's wrong, that I don't need him, that I know better. And I can handle my life all by myself. And if you're like me and you don't actively rest, you're telling God the same thing. God, I got this. I can handle it in my own strength, in my own power. God, you don't know what you're talking about. I don't need to rest. And you know what that is? That's pride. And that's sinful. And so this morning, uh, I'm re coming to you confessing that sin, that I have this sin of pride that tells God that I don't need to rest because I can do it myself. And so I'm asking for you to keep me accountable that I can add rest into my life. And I'm going to do the same for you if you want me to. And so I'm going to try to relearn how to do that. I hope you guys will come on that journey with me as we become people of God who know how to rest and not just take a day off and do nothing, but to come and rest in him and trust that he knows better than we do. So if you'd like to join me on that pursuit, you can come down and you can pray with me. We can pray together. Maybe you have some other prayer requests or some things that you want to take up to God today. Uh, this We're going to sing a song here. If you have anything that you want to share with the church, come on down and let me know. Maybe you and God need to have some conversations by yourself. You can do that and come up to the front and we'll pray with you and for you, but we'll leave you alone. Maybe you just want to do that at your seat where you are. But this is our response time. What does God want you to do today? Would you, would you stand if you're able and sing with us? Or just reflect on these words. Lord, I come.